Hello, this is Professor Keen. We are looking at chapter four in a student's guide to the great physics texts. In this chapter, Benjamin Franklin is describing some of the experiments that he carried out with a Muschenbrook bottle or a Leiden jar, which is nowadays known as a capacitor. This is contained in his third letter to Mr. Collinson. Let's take a little bit of time looking at the specific experiments that he's carrying out with this Muschenbrook bottle. We began this in our last lecture by talking about experiment number one, which is on page 46. Let me remind you what that experiment was about. So he imagined taking a Muschenbrook bottle, which consists of a metal sphere attached to a wire. This is fixed through a cork, an insulating cork, and it's put into a glass jar like this. He put water in the glass jar. I'm not going to draw the water. Oh, yes, I will. So I put water in it like this. Okay. And then what he did is he placed this on top of a wax block. The wax block prevents any charge from escaping. This jar, by the way, had previously been electrified. So the ball and wire is positively charged, and he's going to argue that there is negative charge on the outside of the jar. So he electrifies it, and then he sets it on this wax block. Now, what is the experiment that he carried out? Well, he hung a small pith ball made of cork from, the, from a silk wire, and the important point was this pith ball was uncharged. So this is an uncharged or unelectrified pith ball, very light, like a piece of styrofoam. And he noticed that when you do this, the first thing that happens is the pith ball swings toward this metal ball, and it swings toward it, and it makes contact with it. Okay, so the pith ball swings toward ball swings toward the charged wire. Now you might ask, why in the world does this happen? That's a great question. After all, it's a neutral ball, so why would it be attracted to a positive charge? After all, uh, Franklin is going to argue that positive charges attract negative charge, and positive charges repel, um, repel positive charges, but why would a positive charge attract a neutral object? Well, there's a way to think about this, so let me zoom up on this scenario and show you why this might happen. Okay, so here is our positively charged Leiden jar. I'm zooming up on this. This is neutral, but when an object is neutral, what that means is that there is, according to, to Franklin, some um, equilibrium level of electrical fluid in it. And when there's this equilibrium level of electrical fluid in it, that is influenced by this positive charge. In particular, this positive charge is going to repel the electrical fluid from this side so that you're going to get more of this electrical fluid on this side and less of it on this side. So this side of the ball is going to become positively charged, and this side of the ball where there's a deficit becomes negatively charged. So in other words, this ball becomes polarized. This is not the terminology that Franklin uses. This is more modern terminology, but that's, that's a way to think about what's happening here. Now, that's step one. It becomes polarized. Step two is that once it's polarized, it is attracted to the positive charge on the Leiden jar. Why would it be attracted? After all, it's still neutral. Well, the negative charge is attracted to the positive, and the positive is repelled from the positive, but they don't have equal strengths. Notice that the negative charge on the left-hand side is closer to that positive charge than the positive charge is to the positive charge. So the fact that this pith ball is attracted implies that there is a distance-dependent force. This negative charge is more strongly attracted to the positive than the positive charge on this side is repelled from the positive. So that is precisely why it swings toward it and touches it. 
Now what happens after it touches it? Well, once it touches it, then some of the positive charge that is inside of this positively charged ball is leaked onto by contact. It goes onto this, so this becomes positively charged. So now the pith ball gains an overall positive electrification. It's no longer neutral. Okay? And because it gains an overall positive electrification and positives repel positive, there's a force of repulsion and it swings away. So you can kind of think about this as step one is the polarization attraction. Step two is contact transfer positive charge and repulsion. And that is why now this ball will swing away and stay away from this positively charged uh, wire on the Leiden jar. Franklin also mentions that if you were to then lower your hand, take the silk and lower it down like this so that this positively charged pith ball is near the jar, it then gets attracted toward the jar. This is some of the evidence that Franklin uses to argue that the outside of this jar must be negatively charged. Again, consider how difficult of a scenario this is. It's, we're drawing these pictures with little pluses and minuses everywhere, but those don't appear in nature. We don't see pluses or minuses. All we see is a ball attracting or repelling from different regions on this Muschenbrook bottle. And we're trying to come up with some kind of story, a parable, an account of why it is doing this. Okay, so I hope that provides a bit better explanation of what he's talking about in experiment one. Let's talk now about experiment two. So that was experiment number one. Now let's talk about experiment number two. Experiment two is depicted in figure 4.1, part A. So let me read what's happening here. He says on page 46 that from a bent wire A sticking in the table, let a small linen thread B hang down within half an inch of the electrized file C. So you have to imagine over here, you've got this, this wire sticking up like this and it's, you've got this little tiny thread hanging down here, but it's not touching the file. This is in the table. This file has been electrified so that the interior right here is positive, and he's going to argue the exterior is negative, and it is prevented from discharging because it's on a wax block. Okay, then he says, now touch the wire of the file repeatedly with your finger, and at every touch you will see the thread instantly attracted by the bottle. So in other words, that hanging thread swings over toward the outside of the glass bottle. Why would it be doing this? Well, when you touch your finger to the positively charged ball that's attached to the wire going into the bottle, your finger becomes positively charged. It picks up some of that positive charge. It goes down through your arm, through your elbow, let's say, that's resting on the table, and then it can go up through that, that wire A up to the ring and down through the thread. Now that thread has a slight positive charge. It has some positive electricity. And since the exterior of the jar is negatively charged, it swings over toward it so as to complete the circuit. So you might imagine this jar has a positive and negative separation of charge between the interior and the exterior. And you are providing through your finger, finger your arm, your elbow, the table, the wire A and the thread, a a circuit through which this positive charge can go back through and be attracted to the negative charge on the outside of the bottle. So that's an explanation of experiment two. Experiment three also, so let, let me just mention now that we're going to experiment three, I'm not going to go through all of these experiments in detail. I just want to walk you through them. I think it's worthwhile for you spending a little bit of time thinking about these. In experiment three, that's depicted in figure 4.1 part B on the right hand side of the figure on the top of page 46. He said, fix a wire in the lead with which the bottom of the bottle is armed, part D, so as that bending upward, its ring end may be level with the top or ring end of the wire in the cork, E. So here he's not using his standard Muschenbrook bottle. He's using a Muschenbrook bottle where there's a lead foil wrapped around the bottom. And that lead foil at point D is attached to the wire that goes up to a ring on the left-hand side at point E. 
So any negative charge on the jar is collected by this lead foil and the point E on the left hand side becomes negatively charged. So now you have a situation where you have negative charge on the left ring at point E and positive charge on the right ring at point E or that ball that's inserted into the center of this vial. Now what you do, he says, that gap between the left E and the right E is about three or four inches distant. He says then, after having electrized the bottle and placed it on the wax, if a cork is suspended by a silk thread, F, it hangs between these two wires, it will play incessantly from one to the other side till the bottle is no longer electrized. Why would it do this? He says point F, you hang it between those and it starts rattling back and forth between point E on the right and point E on the left. Well, in order to understand this, let's go back to experiment one. Remember this, this pith ball F is uncharged, but if it's a little bit closer to the right ball, which is positively charged, it becomes polarized, becomes attracted, rushes over, touches it, picks up positive charge, and then is repelled. Of course, it's repelled from the right ring. It swings over toward the left ring, which is negatively charged. And once having made contact with the left ring, it dumps its charge over there, picks up negative charge, and then is attracted and swings back over to the right ring. And this process is repeated until the jar comes to equilibrium. That is where it had been in this electrical tension with positive charge on the inside and negative charge on the outside, this out of equilibrium condition, this pith ball rattling back and forth is ferrying the charge between the, the electrical fire from one side to the other so as to reestablish equilibrium. Okay, I don't think I'm going to go through experiments four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. You can look through those on your own, but these are variations on these themes. In some cases, like in figure 4.2 on the left-hand side, he's showing how you can connect the interior and exterior of the jar with a wire so as to discharge it. There's sparks that jump across it. He's showing on the right-hand side how if you connect them permanently, you cannot electrify the vial because you cannot get it to be out of equilibrium. So you should look through those on your own. And the next time we get together, I want to talk about his fourth letter where he starts providing a bit more detailed explanation of these phenomena.